All right. Welcome, everybody. Farm to Table Week 2. How's it going? Chef Greg, Chef John, how are you? Good, thank you. Good. Good. Uh, hello, nice. everybody. Sorry, sorry. What? Oh, I was going to say, nice to see you back. Yeah, I was going to say, nice to see all of you. Um, my apologies for missing out um, last week. Uh, but I'm here with you now and will be with you for the rest of the time. Next, uh, you know, three months basically we'll have together. Um, um, one thing to mention, I'll, I'll, next week I'll get into a little bit about what I actually experienced on the, uh, the farms, the, the orchard groves. But I just wanted to give a quick hello. Um, I know that Chef Jamie, Chef John, Chef Greg did an awesome job last week. But I just want to give a little bit of um, my input so you know where I come from as well. Uh, I want this to be a happy, healthy learning place for everybody. There are uh, no stupid questions, wrong answers. I mean, technically, yes, there can be wrong answers, but there's no stupid answer, right? It, never feel afraid to contribute. Uh, make sure we all respect one another, opinions. Um, uh, again, this is a place to learn. I uh, want you all to feel comfortable to ask questions if something you need clarification on. Uh, feel free to reach out. Uh, on the side, outside of class, uh, and send me or any of us messages about questions that you might have that doesn't, not always just about class, but maybe something about another cooking technique or opportunities. Use us as a resource, okay? That you guys are in school, use us as a resource. Um, let's see what else. Um, did you, did Chef Greg and Chef John, did you guys give a little background about yourselves last, uh, last one, last class? Yeah? All right, cool. I'll give a quick snippet of myself, and then we'll get into the show on the road. Uh, basically, uh, worked all over the world, uh, predominantly, uh, a little bit in, um, you know, Turkey, Serbia, Russia, India, Colombia. I love food. I can't get enough of it. Um, I find that it is the common denominator to all of us on the planet because um, we don't need to use words, right, to communicate, but we can communicate with food, right? Sharing food with one another is uh, the greatest act of all, um, I, I believe. And uh, all barriers are breaking down at that point. Uh, so um, remember why you got into this industry. Uh, that's what always um, pulls me close to, you know, if I ever stray or have thoughts, it is a never ending source of, of knowledge. Uh, whatever you want to learn about, there's, you can go down so many different directions, whether it's nutrition or, um, or catering or certain specific cuisines, techniques, spices, vegetables, it's never ending. So um, have fun uh, and yeah. Uh, if you have other questions about what I've done, I worked on farms for a little while. Um, so uh, sustainability, um, farm to table, um, the environment uh, is all, are all very important things to me, uh, but mostly cooking with, uh, with passion, all right? And full utilization, reducing waste, all right? Because guess what? Not only is that good for the earth, it's good for your pocket. So every business wants to make a profit, all right? That's the end goal. If you're going to have a business, you want to be profitable, right? Well, guess what? Where is, where, where's one of your biggest uh, areas to make a profit? Where do you have control in the kitchen? Food cost. Yeah, there you go. Food waste, food cost, right? That contributes to it. The less you waste, the less you waste the more you make, okay? Utilization of all products. How can you take, you know, one product and make the most out of it, okay? So uh, we are gonna talk about a lot of stuff in this class. Uh, some things uh, we will debate about. Uh, what's wrong, what's right, how to make a profit, how do you not make a profit? Is, do you use natural, do you use organic? What does natural and organic mean? Is there a difference? Let's talk about that right now. I know uh, last class, uh, they, uh, the chefs asked you guys about, hey, what does natural mean to you? What does organic mean to you? Who uh, is willing to pay more for a product that states uh, organic or natural? 
Some people no, some people yes. Who's willing to uh, buy full on GMO uh, genetically engineered products? Who thinks uh, animals should be raised in a, in a decent living arrangement? So that and fed decent food, right? Okay. How do we think the uh, workers who are harvesting fruits and vegetables during harvest season should be treated? Respect, right? They need to earn a living wage. How do we think we should handle um, recycling? products that we're utilizing in the restaurant industry. Are we using styrofoam? Are we using something that's gonna uh, decompose quickly, break, her down, break down easily? So these are all things that start to come into play when it's beyond just the food, right? right? We all got into this industry because we love cooking. I would hope so. If you're not, wrong place to be, okay? So, <laughs> but, there's so much more to it. Every decision you make has an impact, right? Just like every action has a reaction, same thing. What we buy, right? What we use, what we serve. Now, that does not mean, hey, the only way to be a good company is to do everything organic, everything local, uh, everything in biodegradable containers. Not possible. Very difficult to execute and be profitable doing that. You've gotta be in the right area, right time, right everything. Not easy. But can you make little switches that might have a big impact? Totally. New York State is eliminating styrofoam. Bamboo straws are replacing plastic straws. Changes are happening in New York, right? So just start thinking, we've got a lot to learn this block. All right, so now uh, let's talk about this past week. Um, anybody, this is how we like to, this is how I usually like to do it. Uh, throw it out to you all first. Experiences, pros, cons, something you liked, something you disliked. Talk to us about your experience. What sauce did you make? Let's hear it. Who wants to share? Gremolata, chimichurri, pesto, zoo, who made what? Let's hear it. See a chimichurri from Dorothy. Pesto, anybody else want to talk? I did a chimichurri with lamb chops. Awesome. I like it. Nice combo. Sauteed shrimp and homemade linguine with chimichurri. Cool. Gremolata with salmon, awesome. You guys are doing some nice combos. Pesto with your own basil, fantastic. All right, Jeff. Travis has his hand up. Yeah, Travis. I made uh, chicken breast with pesto and Hasselback potatoes, but my chicken breast, there's a little store in the town where I live, it's called Food is Fuel. It's all farm to table. There's a farm about four miles down the road where they butcher their chickens, they butcher their beef, their pigs, and they get sold right out of the store in this town where I live. Awesome. Where do you live, Travis? Orfordville, Wisconsin. All right. Cool. Yeah. Hey, Midwest representing always. I'm from Chicago. I know. I have a feeling. Uh, good <laughs> stuff. <laughs> cool. Um, so, let, let me ask you a quick question. I'll, I'll put you on the, on the stage for a second. Do you notice a taste difference when you get chicken from a place like that compared to chicken from a regular grocery store? Complete, complete different taste, different texture, complete different everything about it. When you buy from a farm to table, then instead of going to like Walmart or Aldi's and buying your, your meat produce. 100%. I think it's a lot juicier. It doesn't dry out like regular store-bought chicken when you cook it. Great observations. You're 100% right. 
Um, now, in a perfect world, right, we could all afford to get local farm-raised meats, eggs, cheese, produce, right? I wish I could. I know I can't afford that, right? It's hard, okay? Uh, but uh, I challenge everybody uh, to do a, uh, a taste comparison. We'll have that later on in uh, this class, but um, do a taste comparison between, uh, you know, for me, the best example is a, is a, a, good, a really high quality sour cream, like an organic one, right? Maybe that's made with grass-fed um, um, cows versus a conventional commodity one that has thickeners, different um, agents and different ingredients in it. And, and do a textural and flavor profile challenge and on one. Um, you will, I think you will notice a difference. Now, you're not gonna notice the difference always. Uh, Chef Greg and I have had a conversation about uh, zucchini squash. Are you gonna be able to tell the difference between uh, an organic zucchini and a conventional zucchini that you buy at a grocery store that's been shipped uh, 1,200 miles? Probably not. Maybe. Are you going to be able to tell the difference between a uh, zucchini uh, grown up the road versus one that's shipped 1,200 miles? Yeah. You'll notice that difference before you notice the necessarily the difference between conventional and organic in produce, okay? When we're talking about massive distribution. Uh, but meats, eggs, dairy products, I personally, and everybody's going to have their own different view on this, and that is fine, right? We're all individuals. We should all have our own opinions. I notice a huge difference between an organic or a grass-fed animal protein dairy product compared to conventional, more than, more than in produce, okay? We'll talk about that later, but start thinking about what those animals eat, conventional mass-produced livestock. Think about their diet because we all know that we are what we eat. All right. Um, Before you get going, Chef, Rita has a hand up. Yeah, Rita. Yeah, I just wanted to say, well, I had chimichurri with uh, ribeye steaks. And since then, I've been using my chimichurri, the, the leftover with other meats, and it goes pretty good with, you know, with, uh, with just about anything, right? Thank you. Uh, awesome. Yeah, a chimichurri, right? That hails from Argentina, traditional Argentinian sauce, steaks, meat. Awesome. Cool. Um, Chef Greg, Chef John, anything that you would, oh, wait, one thing I want to mention. I did post an announcement um, that you guys all should have received a, a, an email about. If you're having difficulty finding seeds, uh, they went over this uh, last class, but we do have that alternative option to grow from a food scrap, such as a carrot top, a, the base of a romaine, a head of lettuce, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> That's posted. So if you were having difficulty finding seeds, this is an alternative. All right. Um, start that up and add that to your um, uh, photos, your folder for this week's assignment. And then we're going to be checking that in um in later weeks i see somebody doing um garlic bulbs yeah awesome garlic bulb that's another great way i've got some actually hold on i've got some right here i'll show you so garlic super easy who's ever done this right uh garlic too long and here's your regular bulb of garlic right i eat garlic all the time you guys are glad that this is up on computer um <laughs> here it is Who's ever had this happen in their, in their cabinet, right? Where the garlic starts to sprout? Yeah, throw that in the ground, grow it. Guess what? This, now this one's dry. It's a little baby garlic bulb. Normally this will all be, uh, you can see, right? Green, pull this out right here. We've got fresh garlic, okay? So you can grow from clippings, tons of ways to grow. So check out that, um, Website I sent if you had difficult uh, finding, uh, difficult time finding seeds and you'll be back in the, the, the show and running. Because we will be requiring those photo updates throughout the next three months. All right, yes, week three. Um, so Chef Greg, Chef John, any comments on week one?
Uh, yeah, so I love how excited people were with the creativity that was built into this assignment, getting to choose your own side, getting to choose your own protein. It was really cool to see that excitement in your narratives coming through and in the, the dishes that you all chose to do. Um, keep in mind, this is the last practical class. So we do want some good detail. We want some good discussion in that flavor journal. Really push yourselves to have a real conversation about that taste or texture or aroma and push that vocabulary up to that next level because you're about to be going into commercial kitchens in your externship. So you wanna make sure that you're really pushing yourself to be able to describe those things in detail. Um, so push past that one word savory descriptor uh, with that flavor journal, that is one of the more common kind of stumbling points that I saw this week was whenever we have an assignment, same as anywhere else, even though you get to pick your protein, I still want to see a conversation about how that protein came out. So, uh, came out in your flavor journal. Don't just talk about the recipe you're given, but talk about the whole assignment and all the components that are there. Yeah, we have a hand up. Alejandro, do you have a question or a comment? Um, when you're when you tell us to be extremely de as descriptive as possible, how do you and versus having to do that in an actual kitchen for a dish? How would you form a sentence using descriptive words? So, are you talking about basically a menu description, or are you talking um, about describing? Because there would be two approaches, like one would be your menu description, right? That's what's going to lure your customers in, get them excited about uh, the dish. Say it's a hamburger, okay? And you just say, uh, hamburger on bun with ketchup, mustard, lettuce, tomato, onion. How about charbroiled or charbroiled black Angus uh, or your primer, you know, whatever. You start adding these descriptives, right? Juicy. Uh, hand, freshly hand ground. Uh, what type of cheese are you using? What type of bun are you using? Now, that's one way to do a menu description where you're adding adjectives or descriptors to your menu description. It's another thing if you're going to have, say you're sitting around, right, before we're going to have service tonight, and I want, and, and Chef Greg and Chef John both have their own specials that they've created, and they're going to describe it to the staff and the entire team so that the staff, front of the house staff, can then go into further detail if the customer says, well, can you give me a little bit more explanation on that charbroiled uh, burger? So okay. there are two different ways. Which one would you like to know more information about? How to make a menu description or the, 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 flavor, the words to uh, describe to staff, et cetera? The words to describe to staff. Okay. Um, so that's when I personally would suggest, um, do we have that, I'm trying to figure out, like, I think I've got another list that's a little bit more. A big uh, thing you would want to communicate though, is if you think about this week, if you had done pesto, pesto has nuts in it. So that's an, a huge allergen. It's actually one of the more severe ones. So you start to think about like the key points of the production points, how it's made. So they can describe it. If maybe it pairs with wine or a beverage that you want to highlight also. Any type of allergens, you want to make sure you specify there's gluten in it, there's nuts in it, nightshade, fish, shellfish, whatever those allergens are. So that way, when you communicate it to the staff, that's pretty much how you want to hear it if you were sitting at a table and the server came over and said, would you like to hear about the specials? So you have to think of it kind of in that mindset. If you were the customer, you would want to know all the allergens. You'd want to know how it was cooked. There could be temperatures, textures, could be anything on there. So you're just taking a menu description like you would read, and then you're expanding that until you can make it into a conversation. Okay. I am gonna pull this up really quickly to show you. Cause I think sometimes we get, we get stuck on, um, you know, just the, those go-to words, right? If it's salty or spicy. But what type of spice is it? Uh, is it acidic? But what type of acid? C is it citrusy or is it more vinegar? 
right? There's different types. Or is it more like lactic acid? Does anybody know what lactic acid would be describing? Milk. Did I hear somebody saying milk? Milk. Yeah, awesome, lactic acid, right? Milk, yogurt, dairy products, buttermilk, all of those have that dairy, lactic, lactose, right? Lactose intolerant. Lactic acid, that's that dairy acid. And then you have citrus acid, citric acid, which is the lemon, the lime, the grapefruit, the orange. And then you have a vinegar acid, right? That would be from any type of fermentation or different vinegars. So let me just pull this up because there are tons of words to describe. Check this out. Here's 120 suggestions to describe food. Acid, acrid, aged, bitter, bittersweet, bland, burnt, buttery, chalky, cheesy, chewy, chocolatey, citrusy, cool, creamy, crispy, right? This is, that's, the list is gonna go on and on and on, okay? A lot of these are uh, um, just descriptors. Sticky, is it stringy, is it dry, is it chewy, is it smooth? Is it, is it tender? What's the appearance, right? All of these things, you take in all senses, right? You see, you get that visual, you have the aroma, right? The nose, you have the actual flavor and taste. Maybe you also sometimes hear it, right? Think, think about it, let's, let's ask you, let's ask a question. What type of dish is gonna come out and you're gonna hear it? What do you hear? Think about it. Give me one dish. Fajitas. Boom, yes, yeah. exactly. So you're at a Mexican restaurant, Tex-Mex, right? And all of a sudden, you know, the waiter's walking out with this sizzling platter, okay? So now your other sense is evoked, okay? Got all these things. So maybe you're adding sizzling to that fajita description. Spicy, fiery, robust. Okay, lots of words, all right? So, um, you know, uh, I, I'll share this uh, a list with you guys so that you can just start thinking. Sometimes it helps to just look it up. It, it's easy to get caught into, this is sweet. But sweet is not a good descriptor. Right? It's fine. What type of sweet? Okay. Yeah, Veronica. Veronica, I see your hand up. All right, Veronica, come back to us if you want. Rita? Okay, on our plants. What kind of temperature will we will like for will it be indoors or outdoors? Because hey, like, Rita, can like you put, now, Rita, can you put that week to like hey, Rita. Fall, you know, late fall month or whatever? And Rita, we can't hear you. Can you put it? Can you put it into your yes. into the chat, please? It's it's hard to hear you. You're breaking up. Part of it was whether she should grow it indoors or outdoors. And Rita, that honestly, that depends on where you live. If you think about like Montana, Wyoming, Idaho, Colorado, all those states that are getting this huge frost and snowstorm, you wouldn't want to put it outside. But if you live somewhere like Louisiana, Alabama, Florida, Texas, California, you probably definitely still have the weather to keep that outside. So that one's just going to kind of depend on, on your location and how you're temperature extremes go up and down. Sunlight though, of course, you do need photosynthesis. So sunlight will be very important. Yeah, keep it warm, right? A seedling is, is a, it's like a baby, right? You wanna give it what it needs. You wanna give it a nice, warm, comfortable environment. You wanna give it sunlight, a little bit of water, not too much. And if, it, and if, it, uh, if the, the seed fails, start with a few seeds and, and start again or start with one scrap and start again and start again uh it's not easy the whole point of this is that it is not easy to um uh grow vegetables 
or, or herbs or anything. Uh, it takes a lot of time um, tending to. So to understand and appreciate how much it takes to, to grow vegetables, all right? Um, especially when you have cats. Yeah, uh, if you have cats, uh, keep those, keep it protected. Um, all right, so let us hop into a little bit of class because um, we're running, we're running late, but that happens, um, had to do, go through the uh, intros. So, Are you able to hear me now? I'm sorry. Yes, Veronica. This was Veronica. Yeah. I, I, had, I did have a question at, on the descriptive part. I was trying to catch you before you moved on. I couldn't get it unmuted, but yeah. I was just asking if there, what would you consider if there was a description? Would this be more of a menu item description or a staff description if you had lemon pepper chicken and uh, infused uh, with pine nut infused uh, pesto? That would be more of a menu descriptor. Okay. Yeah, because you might want to go into different details with your explaining to the staff. Basically, we're looking at, you know, a menu description is going to be cleaner, shorter, more direct. It's like the okay. um, summary. The menu description is like a summary, and then the explanation okay. to the staff is more of the, the article. More of a detail as to what the ingredients are completely. You got it. Bingo. That's it, right? So that way, okay. then the customer says, hey, what about that pesto? Can you give me some more information? The staff member says, yeah, it's a blend of basil and, and arugula, right? As opposed to just a pesto. So you get more details, but great job. Uh, we can, we will, um, I'll, well, I'll put some other stuff out there about menu descriptors and, and way to write, but this is a really important thing on how to sell products, okay? How to sell menu items. Um, and how to get your staff to sell as well. Because if your staff knows what you're eating and how it tastes, they can push it. All right, let's get into this class page. Where the heck are we? One second. There we go. All right, cool, we're up. So as you all know, oh, just an FYI, this is important. Uh, we are having some weird messaging issues with the program. So um, please pay attention to up here class announcements. This is where I'm going to be putting a lot of information. Uh, Chef Greg and Chef John might also be adding information to here, but this is what you want to check out, right? I'm going to remind you about uh, when assignments are due or cool, uh, interesting, extra reading. Not that it's required, but I'm only going to put cool stuff up there. Same with Chef John and Chef Greg. They're only going to put cool stuff up there. Uh, we're not trying to bore you. We're trying to get you and keep you excited. So tap into that, right? That's stuff that we're looking at, we're using as resources that we find interesting and unique to the industry. So be sure you're looking at this all the time. You'll get announcements about this in your email, but it's just gonna look a little bit different than the normal direct messages that uh, I've been sending you because we're just having an issue with that. So that's just a heads up. Um, all right, now, here we go. <laughs> Excuse me. If we pull into uh, week two, as you can see, here we go. Man, we've got so much to talk about. I'm gonna to have to start blowing through information. All right, hit up that um, research materials uh, and you will see we've got one read on heirloom heritage. What does it mean? Dive into this, okay? This is just a pretty quick overview of what heritage and heirloom does mean. Uh, the next one is what food labels mean and don't. What, uh, what Labels have meaning behind it. Is organic, natural, what, what are they? Free range, whole grain, made with whole grains, low sodium, reduced, okay, blah, blah, blah. Read into that, all right? Then you got a little bit on the pro chefs, um, but this is what I want to pull up next. So, mostly everybody eats red eggs, right? Eggs are pretty popular. I, I know I love eggs. Who's seen all these labels lately on all the egg cartons? Anybody? all these different versions of, of labels. There was a good amount of egg talk in the chat too before when we started. Oh. So good, awesome. good topic. Great, let's do this. So check this out. Take a minute to look over this. OK, 
Cage-free is a really big one, right? I see cage-free on a lot of eggs. But guess what? What if cage-free doesn't mean a whole lot? All it says is free space to roam. It means they're not trapped in a cage for their entire life. Doesn't mean they necessarily have access to sunlight. But in my head, when I hear cage-free, I think those little chickens are out wandering, right? They're out, in, they're out on the grass, eating stuff. Not true. Okay, now free range, a little bit better, but still not necessarily what we think. Prohibits cages, okay, so now no cages. Requires access to outdoors. As you can see that cage free does not require access to outdoors. Free range does, but it's just a small door or a concrete slab counts as access, so they can go out if they want. Does it mean they're going to go out? Not necessarily. Now pasture raised, pasture, now we're getting there, requires hens, uh, hens to go out and hunt, pack, and graze outdoors on their natural diets. Okay. But, Maybe it's, it's not regulated fully, who knows? How about hormone free over here in the lower right corner? It's a marketing gimmick. All egg laying hens are, are not given hormones. What about natural? Again, marketing gimmick. All eggs are natural. Okay, so if you start paying more for some things that don't have added value, you're simply giving money to something that you didn't get any value back other than their marketing or ad campaign. Now, when you start getting into some other things where maybe it's certified humane, maybe it's, um, um, you know, uh, vegetarian fed, okay? Maybe that's something important that there are no, no animal byproducts in your feed. Right, so the animals aren't actually eating potentially other animals, right? Feed, you know, it's a big, big industry. Lots of things get mixed up. So the important thing here is think about where you're putting your money towards and if you're getting a return on that. Because if, when you're in charge of purchasing ingredients for your establishment, if you're paying eight cents more per pound for natural chicken, and natural chicken is not giving you anything, you're literally just put, wasting eight cents, okay? Now, can you put that on a menu, natural chicken, and maybe somebody's more likely to purchase it or be willing to pay a little bit higher a price? Sure, but are you just doing the same thing that, the, that these companies are doing? Yeah, and that's fine. It's a whole part of business, right? It's all about what you decide. I'm not here, none of us are here to tell you what's wrong or right. Marketing is marketing. Writing a menu descriptor is a menu descriptor. If you want to put natural because you're buying natural, that's on you. But does it have meaning? Does it get people to buy? Yeah. So things to think about, right? But remember, at the end of the day, if you're paying for something that you're not actually getting any extra value for, why are you paying for it? Chef, something came up in the chat, actually kind of two times can i cover yeah, it please, quick? Always. oh could you bring could you bring that back up for oh, me oh sure 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 so chef asked in the beginning about animals are they humanely raised are they raised properly and giving proper treatment and a lot of you in the chat said yes it is important i wholeheartedly agree with that but we just got a question in the chat it says what does it mean when it says beak cutting so chickens have beaks right that's how they eat it's also how they defend themselves. They peck, they also peck each other, which does lead to injuries, leads to infections. So to protect the birds from themselves, they cut off the beaks. Now, if we look at where it says certified humane, and we look at the bottom, it says allows beak cutting. So the certified humane labeled product allows them to cut off the beak. However, if you look at American Humane Certified above it, 
or American Welfare Approved on the side, American Welfare Approved prohibits beef cutting. American Humane Certified allows it. So if you're paying more money and you're advertising we have American Humane Certified Eggs, and it's really important to you to have animals that are raised without mistreatment going through their lives, they're still allowed to cut the beaks off. So you definitely have to do a lot of research about what exactly a label means. And that is, that is what beak cutting means. It's a horrible thing. I'm not saying it's a good practice, but if they're labeling things certified humane, American humane certified, that's, that's what they're doing. Exactly. Thank you, chef. So yeah, this is, this is all really important. And the point of, of us sharing this information is so that you start to do your own research, right? That is the most valuable thing. The more you know, the more power you have. Purchasing power. Purchasing power is huge. Know what's important to you. Know where your values lie so that you can make decisions for yourself, your family, your establishment, your customers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, okay? Sometimes, uh, let's be honest, your customer base will not care if it's organic or natural. They just want food and they want it now, okay? And they want it to be tasty. So if you keep pushing some organic stuff on a customer base that doesn't necessarily demand that and your price point's a lot higher, you're not gonna sell no matter what you believe or what you want for the betterment of the environment and the earth, if it doesn't sell, your business is SOL, right? So it's a give and take. It's figuring out what's right, it's figuring out what works for you and, and really just knowing what you're serving and, uh, and how that changes everything, right? The quality, integrity of the product and what you are getting. All right, cool. So, um, Tons of information out there, everybody, all right, on labeling. I'm gonna pull up a few other things quickly, and uh, yeah, we're still, we're gonna be a little bit over today, sorry. Hopefully only like next week it won't happen. Uh, heirloom, heritage, what does this mean? That's in this, uh, that one article I showed you earlier, but I wanna go a little bit deeper into heirloom and heritage. Um, here is some really interesting things. So this is a definition of a heritage swine and pork products, okay? What does it mean? What is heritage swine? Okay, it's a true genetic breed. It might be an endangered breed, okay? They have a long history in the US or elsewhere as well, and purebred status, meaning they've not been mixed with, you know, mated with other um, uh, um, pigs, okay? So really interesting. Flavor profiles are gonna be very unique. Uh, there is a whole, um, uh, is this it? Uh, yes, there's a whole event called Cachon 555, which is put on by, started by a chef who said, hey, we got to get more recognition for these heritage breeds of, of, of pork, of swine, because otherwise they're going to die and we're never going to have them again. In danger, right? Meaning they're gone. If we don't raise them, they're dead, right? We need people to raise and grow certain types of fruits and vegetables and different types of animals. Otherwise, what happens, remember when that avian flu or what happens when a parasite gets in to uh, the, the one uh, you know, varietal of a apples and now we're out of apples, right? The potato famine, that's what happened. They were growing one type of potato, it got infected, decimated the crops, okay? So when you have variety, you're not gonna have that issue. This is, is happening with bananas, with everything. So, a whole other thing, okay? Look, eating them to preserve them. So if we eat them, they get to stay here, right? And they're really, really tasty, actually. Really tasty. Um, uh, heritage uh, pig, pork is, is one of the tastiest things around there, all right? So look that up. Uh, there's also heritage chicken, okay? Look, something important with heritage chicken, slow growth rate. If you look at what, uh, you know, this is something that you're all going to have to do on your own time, but start looking up how, you know, uh, mass-produced chicken, 
uh, livestock are raised, see what conditions they're living in, see what they're getting fed, see what's going on, right? Knowledge is power. Again, I'm not going to show you guys stuff, but you really should be involved in knowing what, how your, how your, your food uh, is being raised. Because if we think that it's okay that chicken's costing 99 cents a pound, we're living in a dream world when vegetables cost more than that. This is an animal. It needs to be raised, fed, grow up to get to production. So we've changed things in industry that allows chickens to grow really quickly, right? Really fast. So, I mean, that's fine. That's totally fine. Technology is an amazing, incredible thing. And it, it has allowed uh, us to eat and, and, and continue and thrive. But it's something to consider, okay? Just to be knowledgeable about it. Doesn't make anything wrong or right. Again, trust me, I wish I was eating heritage chicken. I'm not, okay? <laughs> I, I'm not, uh, I wish I was, but it's not, an, not a thing. Check these out. Look at these heirloom tomatoes, okay? Look at all these different varietals. Beautiful. How many different flavor profiles you have on these, okay? Some are gonna be sweeter, more acidic. They're gonna have thinner skin, thicker skin, smaller seeds, uh, juicier. Um, maybe they're gonna be, uh, you know, not as, as, uh, as toothsome, right? Different applications. What about apples? Think about, I wanna ask you how this. What, what are some of the uh, varieties of apples? What do we think, what do we see in the grocery store? Apples. I'm gonna call out Golden Delicious. What else do we have out there? Granny Smith. Granny Smith, yep, what else? Gala. Gala, yep, great, what else? Fuji. Fuji, yep, Red Fuji. Delicious, Granny Smith, what else? Macintosh. Macintosh, okay. What else? Pink Lady. Pink Lady. Nice. Yellow Delicious. Okay, what else? Honey Crisp. Honey Crisp. Yeah, Honey crisp. Nice. All right. Pretty good start there. Good job, guys. Now, what do we think was offered? Let's go back like 15 years, 20 years. Um, what was at the store? Red Delicious, <laughs> Granny Smith, Golden Delicious. Right? About three, maybe four if we were lucky. What if I told you, uh, huh, well, how about I just show you how many different varietals there actually are? One sec. Check this out. So this is just on A's. All right, let's hop into, what, what letter do we want? Let's see what's in K, are there any Ks? I don't know. Whoa, yeah, there are, great. These are all different varietals of apples. Okay. This is an example of heirloom seeds, seed savers, right? Let's go up onto the S, all right? Another huge, huge array of different apples. And they're all gonna have different, does never, does every, who knows, look at this. I mean, it doesn't stop, okay? Uh, who knows how and why we use different apples for different applications? Give me some examples. What do we do? What do we do with apples? Cook. Cook them. Yeah, you got cooking apples, you got pie right. apples, you got eating Get apples. Me. Apple sauce. Yeah, sure. Yeah, you got cider apples. Canning apples. Canning apples. Right. So this is all based on properties that the apples have. Low moisture, high moisture. Low sugar, high sugar. So think about how this exists with, who knows anything about corn? We are in the land of corn, the Americas, right? I was born and raised on a dairy farm in Wisconsin, so. <laughs> so you have experience and exposure to a lot more varietals than the average uh, person. Yes. Yeah. 
that's very fortunate. Most people don't have that, right? We go to the grocery store and we buy the few things that have been selected and have been designed for mass production. Yeah, we never bought our own beef, never bought our milk. It came right out of the bulk tank and we butchered our own steers and chickens. Cool. Awesome. Um, am I, hey, one sec, Chef Greg, is our other class at seven? Did I totally mess up? No, it says 7.30 on the page, so you're, we got oh, Cool, sorry. And sorry for, you for running a little bit late. I will clean it up and make it shorter next week. Uh, just, we had some intro stuff to take care of. So, uh, there's a ton to learn about. Tons of heirloom, heritage, all these great things. There's so many different awesome products out there, and you get exposure to it, and you taste it, and you start going, oh, I didn't know about this, I didn't know about that. Think about purple corn, pink corn, yellow corn, sweet corn, white corn right? Who's seen those purple carrots out there, right? White carrots, yellow carrots, orange carrots, dark red carrots, different types of bananas, small bananas, big bananas. It just doesn't stop, right? And every region is going to be growing different stuff. So um, get excited because there's so many different flavor profiles out there, textures, um, just ways of saying, oh, I've got this one product, but if I could use this and that, but this changes the acidity, Ooh, I've got a whole new end product. All right, awesome, cool. Um, let us now hop into uh, the class assignment. And if you have questions, does anybody have questions? Are we good? I don't see any hands up. So I know I'm running through a lot of material, but this is how it goes sometimes. There's a lot to share. Uh, let's pull up this assignment and then wrap things up. All right, here we go. Who knows what gazpacho is and where it comes from? Anybody? It's a Mexican uh, soup. Really close. You're so close. Spanish. I like it. I like it. Was that Rita? Yes. Yeah. Good job. Good job. So yeah, a Spanish cold soup. Okay. Uh, right now, we're, you're still going to be able to get some really good quality tomatoes in, you know, depending upon where you live, October, end of, you know, start of October, uh, you know, you should be getting still some flavorful, some, definitely some flavorful tomatoes. Um, so uh, here we go. These are the required photos. Be sure every week, you know, you're putting that um, self ID and sanitation uh, showing the week and the date. This is really important, okay? Because when you go into the restaurant world, when you're in, if you're not already working in the industry, you gotta make a new sandy bucket every day you walk in, change that multiple times throughout the day, and you gotta come in looking clean, right? Nobody wants to see a dirty chef. You're rolling in looking dirty, what do I think? Mm, not best, right? So look clean, look good, look sharp, have sandy, proper mise en place. That means everything's prepped, ready to rock and roll and execute. Proper mise en place is not a bag of bread on the counter. That's not mise en place. All right? Okay, that is not mise en place. You are not ready to start cooking at that point. Mise en place means everything in its place, meaning I'm ready to rock and roll. Okay? So make sure your mise en place is all good. Uh, we're going to be making croutons. Uh, let me pull up the recipe right here. Uh, you're gonna make croutons, okay? So really simple, this is garnish, right? The white bread, olive oil, you could use another oil if you need to. Um, olive oil is gonna give it a little bit nicer flavor, especially being from Spain, you've got olives growing there in that region, olive oil. Um, really simple, um, cook those, get nice golden brown color on that. And then you, you can dry it in a, um, you know, on, a, on a paper towel after that to absorb some of that excess oil if need be. Um, and uh, garnish. Chef Greg is going to show you some really cool uh, photos. Remember, Chef John was talking about how important it is that you're in the last stretch of, this, of, of the program, right? Bring your A-game, not only with your flavor descriptions and your flavor journal, but presentation and how you're executing dishes. So the garnish, right? Small dice, make sure your knife cuts are good. Maybe you're gonna go a little bit fancier and you're gonna show us, show us some of your other skills, okay? We still wanna see a garnish, but like I said, Chef Guy's gonna show you some stuff. Now, when you look at this recipe for gazpacho, who can tell me how to peel tomatoes? How do you peel tomatoes? Blanch them. 
Blanch them. Blanch. First, first you want to do a little a slip. Right? Mm -hmm. Then hot boiling water, blanch, pull them out, shock Ice them. Ice water. Ice water, yep. And then take that skin off, right? Because you want to get a nice mouthfeel, right? So that's a knife's not going to do it. A, a vegetable peeler is not going to do it. You need to um, set up a, a, you know, a blanching station and peel those tomatoes, all right? That's the way you're gonna wanna do it. Really simple, right? You're gonna be pure, pureeing that, blending it. If you don't have, um, excuse me, if you do not have a blender, okay? Uh, you can pass through a food mill and then pass it through another chinois or in another type of strainer, pressing it through. Um, that works. Um, and I'll just pull this up so we have one that again so you can see where we are. So, if, uh, you know, mix everything together, right? You want to liquefy it, pulse, get it in there. Uh, make sure it's nice and as smooth as it can get. Uh, pass through a food mill. Um, and then add in that, um, beat in that olive oil so it incorporates and you don't have uh, little um, oil droplets resting on the top. You want it fully incorporated so that your the mouthfeel, that fat is, is um, uh, distributed equally amongst it. So that way the whole mouthfeel has that fattiness. Because remember, really, look at this list, right? It's a bunch of raw vegetables. Okay, raw vegetables, white bread crumbs, some tomato juice, vinegar. You want to get some fat in there so that, remember, because fat changes that mouthfeel in your flavor profile. Um, Chef Greg. Yes. Have some cool photos to share? Uh, yep, I do. Just one more thing in the chat. Yeah. Don, let me ask, answer Donald. Donald, I see your hand up. What's up, Donald? I just noticed in the recipe it, it calls for fresh white breadcrumbs. How do you do that? Um, so for fresh white breadcrumbs, you're just going to take your, your white bread and, and you can put it, pulse it in a food processor. Yeah, so you don't need to toast it beforehand or nope. you just do it? Okay. So the, in this case, the, these white, this white bread is going to act as a thickening agent. So you know how oftentimes we might make a roux to as, as a thickener or potato or rice? Bread too can act as a thickening agent and that's what this is going to do. So you don't want to toast it because then that's going to dehydrate it. You want, it, you want that to um, lend its thickening capabilities to the... Uh, to the uh, soup. Great question. Okay. Yeah. When I read that, I, <clears throat> I assumed it was like uh, you know the bread crumbs you buy at the store, just like powdery and you know from uh, you know dried toast crumbs. Yeah. No. A little bit different for this one. In a worst case scenario, you could use those, but you're going to want to let that like you're you would want to rehydrate it. But you're also adding a toasted note to that, so it, it's going to be a different flavor profile. You really just want like fresh. Um, fresh bread. Yes. No, oh, right. So a couple of people had mentioned uh, presentation, something they wanted to work on more. So I just have some hints or some suggestions of how you could do that. So I don't know if everybody knows what the Michelin guide is. So the Michelin's a guide and they go around the world and they rate the best restaurants. So if you're on the Michelin guide, you're way up there, you're real deal. So if you go on the internet, and you type in Michelin star plates. These are a lot of what the plates look like. They are extremely beautiful, very detailed. They take a long time to plate, but it could just start to put into your mind and start to pick up what are kind of the similarities here. And a big similarity you will see, you're gonna see a lot of greens. Microgreens, this is a fennel frond right here. There's a ton of items on this. So you start to see a lot of color and a lot of vegetables, even if it's just for garnish. Little edible flowers. So with that being said, we are doing soup this week. So last week we did herb condiments, whatever you chose. So if you think about the top of the basil, where the leaves are really small, maybe even flowering, or parsley leaves, the inside of a celery, the celery heart leaves, oregano, if you're picking those individually, you're pretty much picking and making your own microgreens. So if you start to think about what you can use or what you would have regularly in a restaurant in front of you, these are items you can make an herb salad with or start to garnish things. So we are doing gazpacho. So I typed in Michelin star restaurant gazpacho. 
Now, a couple of these things are not just tomato gazpacho. There are some different ones. But here we have some jalapeno slices. They're pine nuts. For those of you who made pesto last week and have some pine nuts extra. Cilantro leaves on here. Um, don't actually know what the yellow uh, buds are. But this one, they have all their garnishes set in the middle and they're pouring it. You can showcase your soup like that. Just a different vessel in the glass. Kind of looks like a cocktail. And this is actually the top of a basil leaf here. This is beet gazpacho. And this one's tomato. But look at what they have. They have herb oil on here. If you have the chimichurri, the pesto in your refrigerator, it's started to separate a little bit. All that green oil on the top, that's herb oil now. So when you make your soup, maybe you put some dots in there or you make a shape with it. So these are all just garnishes that are going to help you guys plate and everything look better in the future. This one, I just typed in soup plating ideas in the internet. These are not all gazpacho, of course, but if you think about these things, you see a lot of pouring on here. So you're showcasing your garnishes and then you're pouring on top. Showcasing the ingredients again, a lot of vegetables, a lot of color. So when you're plating something, it's completely okay to start to use other sources for ideas and start to see what they're doing. Uh, this one I just like to add because it's really cool and it kind of just shows you can make things out of anything. So if we look at these plates, they obviously look like the Michelin star plates, a lot of color, a lot of items. However, if we look a little more deeply at these plates, this is Doritos, not just Doritos. This one, I'm not sure what the white is. This is fruit roll-ups on this. This is the Twizzlers, the ones that you pull. Uh, Swedish fish. So this individual plates Michelin star plates with just everyday items that you have in your house. This one has Oreos on it. Um, this is like a salami cheese. This is kind of like a little mini charcuterie platter. So even if you don't have just these super high-end items, you can, still plate, you can still plate them high-end. And this is a really good example of how to do that. Uh, where's the other Oreo? It is a lot with Oreos, which kind of really just shows a point. You can do a store-bought cookie, and then you can turn it into a plate like this. So whatever ingredients you have, just think about it. White space cells, you're going to hear that a lot. So don't cramp everything on there, and then that's kind of how you build your repertoire of plating. Awesome. Thank you, Chef. There's inspiration to be found everywhere. All right. Uh, I see a hand up from Alejandro. Um, one of my former mentors at a restaurant I worked at said that you, you as an individual only do like roughly five to 10% of plating. The plate itself does the rest. Yeah, I'm, uh, uh, I like that. It, there is a lot to be said for that. So um, to get a visual for everybody else, remember you want, there's, there's, there's an imaginary line around, right? The rim outside of the point. Is it in the corner? Is it on the other corner? Are they opposing each other? Uh, that's essentially what I believe your mentor was referring to. The plate and how you position it is also enhancing that appearance. You see a lot of blank spaces on those plates, right? that blank space contributes to the overall effect. Uh, so have fun. Uh, next week we can talk a little bit more about playing. We don't have time. I've already um, run too long. My apologies again. Uh, next week we'll put a little shorter. Um, but you can do awesome plating with next to nothing tools. Don't think you need to have some crazy uh, contraption or uh, equipment to do this. Uh, you can do it with toothpicks, with a miniature, you know, a mini spoon, uh, a squeeze bottle, right? Uh, it, the list goes on and on. We'll show you more. You can do it at the bottom of a cup, right? To do a sauce. Okay, so many things. We've got a lot to share. Um, let's see, is there anything else? Um, no, other than knockout, uh, if you haven't submitted your week one assignment, you do have a late period that does come with a negative 15%. So let's make sure that if you did do that, next week you're getting it in on time because 15% each week really starts chipping away at your grade, right? Get it in, plan ahead, uh, execute early, right? Give yourself a due date of Monday night as opposed to Tuesday night to save yourself some uh, stress. Um, 
chefs, any other questions or comments that you want to throw out there? Nope, they're like, nope, and this class. Um, again, no, I'm just messing up with everybody. Seriously though, pleasure to meet all of you. Uh, we've got lots to cover, lots to learn. Please do reach out with any questions, here to help. Um, and let's have a great next uh, rest of the block. Thank you, everybody. Ciao. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.